All right, uh, welcome all to this uh, third lecture of the continual learning course offered at the University of Pisa in conjunction with Continual AI and the AI Doctoral Academy. Um, so I'm sorry if you, um, I mean, uh, uh, will find this lecture a bit uh, undertone, but uh, it's uh, it's because I'm I'm actually uh, a bit sick. So um, I hope you you will be able to enjoy this lecture as the others. Um, um, nevertheless, well, uh, I wanted to start just by asking you if you uh, have some questions related to the previous lecture um, about understanding catastrophic forgetting, or um, even even the previous one. So. Uh, You can uh, open your mic and ask directly, or you can write in the chat. And uh, I guess Andrea will, will convey the, the the questions to me uh, remotely as well. Okay, so uh, it seems that we don't have uh, any specific question. Of course, you can you can. Uh, Always send me a direct email as well to uh, my official account, vincenzo.lamonaco at unip.it, that you can see in this slide as well. Uh, uh, so, um, today's lecture is all about uh, scenarios and benchmarks. So, we're going to look a bit more uh, into these, uh, let's say, the different settings and scenarios that uh, you can build uh, based on um, specific assumptions on the data streams um, that uh, your continual learning algorithm is processing somehow. So in this lecture, we are going to go through uh, these three main uh, parts. First one being uh, an analysis of the different uh, possible continual learning scenarios that you may want to tackle. Uh, then a quick, let's say, overview of the most commonly used continual learning benchmarks. And finally, an exploration with the demo session live um, on Colab of the uh, benchmarks module offered in Avalanche. So how you can use Avalanche to design and develop uh, uh, benchmarks that you can use uh, for prototyping and for assessing the quality of your experiments. Start with the, the first um, uh, part of, of this lecture about the continual learning scenarios. So um, you may find yourself, if, if you're a bit experienced in continual learning, you may find yourself a bit torn by and uh, by the um, difficulty that you may have in understanding different settings and formulations and particular scenarios that a particular paper may be uh, based on. This is because of the impressive, I would say, uh, different amount of, ex of explorations in different directions, different uh, nomenclature, and uh, I would say even conflicting ones. So, uh, I mean, uh, as we repeated multiple times uh, during this course, uh, we, you know, continual learning is not a consolidated field, so it's totally normal at this stage to have a bit of, of confusion and, and, uh, and uh, different views. Uh, not consolidated yet in a, in a single shared one. <clears throat> so um, uh, the main message that I want to convey here is that, uh, and, and I, I will try to explain in the next uh, slides, is that um, it, it's not really important to try to uh, have in mind, in a clear, have it clear in mind, a possible categorization and classification of all these possible scenarios. But what's important is to understand the main, the key um, aspects that are determining the quality of, of a scenario and the impact that these may have on the complexity of the emerging tasks on which uh, you know, um, that this scenario is, is somehow detailing. And so, so the, the idea here would be to give you the basic tools to understand what are the relevant uh, key settings that would uh, define a scenario and then um, based on those uh, choose the, the best classification and way to understand things that you that you you think is is more appropriate 
Um, so before that, uh, let me just take a step back and uh, let's see start discussing that, let's say, um, uh, let's say a more principled and uh, standard view of data set shift in machine learning. So this idea of working with shifting distributions is something that is not uh, completely new or and, and completely, uh, let's say, original, um, originally tackled by continual learning. But it's something that can be linked to uh, previous endeavors and studies that uh, work mostly in understanding how machine learning systems um, can generalize even to, to shifts in the data distribution. So mostly um, a shift that happens in the test set uh, while you're being ready training your system on a training set or with a particular distribution. But the concept remain the same, and I think it's it's worth uh, say discussing them here a bit more in detail, because they may provide also a nice um, view um, on the kind of shifts that we may have also in continual learning. So in the um, let's say the the main reference book for these uh, uh, let's say uh, topic that is a shift in machine learning is what I listed here in at the bottom of the slide. So the, the MIT press book by Queen Nero, uh, Candela, uh, et al. Um, it is um, uh, data shift, data shift in machine learning. And also I linked here uh, an additional, let's say, let's say uh, more of a summary of the possible shifts you may have uh, in, uh, in, in machine learning. And this was made by uh, et al. Uh, the Vector Institute. Um, and, and from this um, summary, you can also see here the uh, image that nicely summarizes the kind of shifts that you can have in machine learning. Um, so let's go through it. So let's say that we want to learn, as, as always, our mapping function uh, from the x, y, uh, x distribution to the y distribution, the input and the output distributions uh, respectively. Then we may find yourself uh, subject to these three main kind of shifts. First one uh, called the coverage shift that is related to a shift in the independent variables. So um, with a probabilistic view of this, we may say that is a change in P of X. Then we may start, uh, be subject to what's called a prior probability shift that is that concerns mostly P of Y, the output variable, and then uh, a, a final and third kind of sheet that may uh, be instead related to the relationship between the independent and the target variable. And this is um, what's called the concept shift uh, that is uh, concerning P of Y given X. So here in the image on the right, you can see these depicted nicely in a, in, a, in a series of four different plots. So let's say that we have our original data uh, belonging to two different classes, this blue class and the, the yellow class, and all these uh, different examples are um, examples that can be labeled based uh, on these, um, uh, let's say, um, particular bound here. Um, <coughs> sorry. And so if we look at the um, coverage shift, what we notice is that uh, essentially um, the boundary here, um, the class boundary is not changed, but uh, the distribution of, of the different points here has actually changed. And this would be the coverage shift. Then for the label shift, uh, um, where uh, the, let's say, prior uh, probability change, and we see that nor the let's say the main distribution of these examples nor the bound uh, the, the the class boundary change, but uh, we see that for example for the yellow class there are less uh, points indeed covering this space. And finally, for the P of Y given X um, uh, concept uh, shift we can see that uh, actually uh, the relationship between these different patterns has changed completely, also the um, class boundary that uh, that separate them. So this is just um, a standard formal way of seeing shifts uh, in machine learning. So I think this is worth mentioning. 
Um, and uh, even our continuing learning literature uh, should try to to find new relationships, let's say, with this um, previous formulation of, uh, of shifts uh, that we may find is that within the same training uh, set of examples that we encounter in our stream of experiences. So apart from the kind of shifts that you can see in, um, in, in machine learning, um, uh, another important distinction is what's called a real versus a virtual shift. So a real shift is, is, um, is a shift that is um, given by a change in the learning objective and in the, in the, in the um, essentially the target hypothesis that you would like to model. And this is often studied um, in, um, in online learning and uh, automated machine learning as um, what happens uh, is that if there are changes in the real world mm -hmm. and we are allowed to process just a set of observations that are drawn from this real world, then um, even if you assume that these um, uh, observations are sampled somehow IAD, then um, if the world is changing and the learning objective is changing, then we would like to see to these to these changes so that our model is able to act effectively in uh, this new updated state of the world. However, um, I don't know if you can see me anymore because I got a, a message from. Um, from teams that uh, the camera was not working anymore. But yes, um, essentially, uh, apart from a real, um, let's say, um, if we're not uh, in the case of a real shift, um, we talk about a virtual shift in which, let's say, this drift, this uh, shift in the data is essentially due just to a sample selection bias. And this is, um, mostly what continuous learning has been focusing um, in recent, let's say, in recent literature. And uh, we're going to talk about this uh, more in depth in, in the next uh, few slides. But just to give you an example of what I mean um, by real virtual shift, uh, let's consider, uh, for example, the, 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 this um, um, case in which we have an agent that has to pick up different lanterns and uh, columns around a static, let's say, fixed room. Um, so this agent um, somehow is able to collect a lot of these different observations um, from the environment that we assume to be, um, and we assume that this agent is able to collect these um, um, observations in an ID way. Well, um, if at some point what happens is that uh, the agent is not rewarded anymore when he gets, for example, a green column, um, but it is indeed penalized then. So, uh, actually, we move from a situation in which picking a column was incentivized and uh, and uh, picking up lanterns, these blue lanterns, was, was penalized. And if we move to a situation, so the real world is changing, where uh, picking up columns uh, is... Um, is penalized in favor of picking up lanterns. So this means that our, let's say, the mapping function, the objective function that we want to learn has actually changed in the world. So the agent uh, now uh, learns how to, to, let's say, adapt to these new situations, new circumstances of the external world, well, where previously encountered observations are not valid anymore. So this is uh, what I would, let's say, label as a real shift and something that we do, we should uh, we should uh, take into account in general for continuing learning, even though it has not been the focus of it uh, up till today. So what instead um, is mostly uh, uh, the, the main, let's say, focus of continuing learning research today is the virtual uh, shift um, uh, case in which Shifting the data, so in the experiences we encounter, uh, uh, is just um, the result of a sample selection bias, um, where we assume that all the previous examples all, or, or the previous uh, observations are still valid, and we need to accumulate knowledge over time. Uh, so, um, 
So we have seen the different shifts in machine learning and how these shifts can be uh, somehow labeled as real or virtual depending on um, the kind of sele or sample selection that you may have uh, in your problem and the fact uh, that if, if the world is actually no statutory as, as, a, as I say, a, a truthful uh, property of the environment. So, um, that said, um, we may found ourselves, as I was mentioning before, overwhelmed by the numerous um, proposals for scenarios, categories, and uh, differences. Um, but this is also given to the um, objectives that are often different. Uh, so, for example, um, for many researchers, the idea of, of learning from a sequence of well-designed, well-defined tasks uh, was one of the main priorities for continuing learning. For some others, instead, uh, learning from a sequence of very small, not only the um, batches of data was, um, was a priority, or for um, even other people, the the idea of learning one pattern at a time, one example at a time, was was uh, the preferred way of learning continually. So you see that um, these um, let's say uh, different scenarios that uh, we have learned to to explore and to see in the continuous learning literature as just the result of um, the will to explore different objects, objectives and different dimensions of the same problem. And so this also resulted in very different assumptions that were made more or less explicitly um, uh, in the definition of, of the scenario. So, for example, um, um, how the settings in the data that you, that you encounter are different in terms of training and testing we're going to discuss these more in details in the next uh, lecture about metrics and data evaluation protocols, but this is an important point. So how these scenarios are defined in terms of, of training and testing settings, then the kind of the amount of supervision you may have in these scenarios, or the, the if you if you got labels, for example, if you have task labels or additional supervised signals signaling the change in distribution, the shift in distribution, virtual again, um, or uh, if we have uh, uh, rewards, sparse rewards, um, if you're uh, dealing with a reinforcement learning case. And uh, another possibility may be the kind of content that you may find into, the, into our experience, uh, ex ex experiences, that is, new classes or maybe just new examples of classes you have already seen and defined a priori um, or both um, or anything else. So um, what we can do is instead to, to find what are commonalities of these different scenarios. Um, and so let's start from these. So what are the main settings, the main assumptions that we can say are very common in recent continuing learning literature. So first one being is that the focus, as we mentioned, is um, on virtual shift. So the fact that forgetting is mostly not needed um, and that uh, accumulation of knowledge is enough, essentially. So since we are not dealing with uh, a real shift in, in, uh, in the hypothesis we would like to model in our uh, learning objective, um, we're saying that, that there's no actual conflict in, in, in what we have seen over time, and we can just accumulate this knowledge and try to, to possibly generalize um, this knowledge over time. Um, so there's no uh, conflicting no, uh, evidence in a sense that we are also modeling a mathematical function so that for each x, uh, there is only, only one valid uh, y. So if we, for example, are in the... In the um, case of um, of a uh, virtual agent exploring um, an environment and picking up columns to learn terms then in that case we assume that with a single image uh, um, that the agent is confronted with the, the best action to choose um, uh, is is just one right and uh, or for um, an image you would like to classify uh, uh, maybe related to an object uh, recognition problem uh, the let's say class that is correct for that particular image is just one. 
Then another, um, let's say, uh, common assumption that, that is made in recent continued learning literature is the idea of an unbounded time between uh, the processing of two different experiences. So we are not in a, in a let's say, real situation in which uh, we do not control the, um, let's say, the um, um, uh, velocity of the learning experiences and how they are collected, but instead we can uh, uh, allow our models to take as much time as we want to process that particular experience. So this is uh, quite a nice property that is, is not, uh, for example, true for biological learning systems that need to uh, process uh, streaming data as they arrive and as they are processed uh, by our biological senses. Um, but for now, it may be a realistic assumption, especially for systems that can be uh, heavily parallelized in some cases. Um, then the, the final and the fourth uh, assumption that I wanted to mention here is that we are assumed that um, we can process e uh, the content of each experience uh, together and as we please. So we can shuffle the examples within the, exper the experience, we can process them multiple times, we can actually um, use this um, data the way we like. So this is also um, a common assumption that you may want to, to remember. Okay, so we have understood that there are, let's say, um, basic ways to frame shifts in machine learning, uh, that the shift may be virtual and real, and that we are mostly focused on virtual shifts. Um, we have seen that there have been a number of different explorations in different directions, and there are possible, different possible definition of interesting scenarios in continued learning, like class incremental, task incremental, domain incremental, task free, task agnostic, and you will hear many more of these. Um, but I think it's it's nice to see now what are the key settings uh, that uh, are indeed defining these different scenarios and distinguish them. Because um, I think that, that at least the four that I, I'd like to mention here are fundamental and something that uh, uh, you should really uh, be aware of. So the worst, the first one being the availability of task, um, let's say distribution labels during training and or testing. Mm -hmm. So um, um, it, it, it was shown uh, in, in the recent past that the availability of a task signal, let's say an additional supervised signal that would uh, give um, our learning algorithm the, um, let's say, the, the um, ability to uh, customize some specific behaviors uh, for the objective hypothesis is indeed very useful and is making the problem of learning continually uh, much easier. Um, so uh, um, this is something that heavily, let's say, characterizes a particular scenario, given the fact that there's a huge impact on the final performance of the model, um, even though it's been recognized as being, uh, let's say, um, kind of a, of a not really realistic assumption to make. And given the fact that, especially um, in the, for some problems, it may be difficult to specialize, specify for each experience and even for each example, maybe, to which task they belong to. So um, um, it may be useful instead to consider scenarios in which, um, you know, these additional supervised signals are very sparse or they are not existent at all. A second, let's say, important setting that uh, that uh, we should consider and is um, uh, defining uh, uh, another set of possible scenarios is uh, the, uh, let's say, um, presence, let's say, availability of uh, this uh, shift, let's say, boundary signal or um, uh, even, uh, let's say, the, what, what, I mean, um, what kind of boundaries we're talking about. So. Um, it is clear that even if we don't have any task label uh, that is defining, let's say, characterizing a particular subset of the distribution we, we, are, we would like to model in our continual learning problem, then uh, if we know if at a specific time in, in, uh, in um, uh, uh, step in time, 
there has been a change in distribution, we can act um, and uh, you know in specialize our learning algorithm so that it can somehow consolidate what has learned before and make new space for new knowledge, for example. So uh, many continuous learning strategies and algorithms you're going to discuss um, in the next lectures, they uh, take advantage of this idea of knowing uh, um, when a shift in distribution is happening uh, or assuming that the shift in distribution is coincident with the start of a new experience uh, in the industry. So this is something that you should really uh, be aware of, and uh, even though sometimes it's not really well conveyed in a research paper, it's something that you should try to look for. Because it, it again, it impacts on, on the complexity of the problem you're modeling, but also on the different strategies that you can use to solve it. Um, then the third, let's say, important uh, key setting that uh, that I think is, is relevant is uh, the content of the experiences. Uh, so what, we, what, can we, what can we find uh, within uh, each experience uh, in terms of, of type of data? So uh, in a classification problem, we may say, for example, if we have just new classes or if for each experience we have just new examples related to the same set of classes or if we find like um, both of them, together or um, it, uh, we, we don't make any particular assumptions uh, of these at all. And these impacts, I mean, many strategies are limited in terms of, of, um, of uh, where they can be applied based on the content of the experience because they leverage the fact that, for example, for every new experience you may have a particular type of examples. So this is also um, a constraint that is sometimes imposed. Um, in many scenarios and uh, in many strategies that leverage some of these assumptions. Finally, uh, a fourth, um, I guess there are more, but uh, this is uh, something that I think is, is important, is very, very important uh, as well, is the type of problem you are trying, you're aiming to solve, right? And um, so in this case, if you're focusing on classification, I maybe mean, the kind of classification problems, but these may be extended easily on deep regression problems. Uh, with the idea of, of uh, classes as just new um, dependent, um, let's say, uh, variables uh, that you add over time. Um, so um, what I mean by unique co-partition classification problem. So um, if we are in a single classification problem in which we want to distinguish every class from all the rest, then this is for sure more difficult than having a problem that it is instead partitioned in different parts. So that I want to, for example, recognize um, a class among just a set of possible classes. And then we have, have a second, let's say, part of the problem is distinguish another set of possible classes completely detached and orthogonal um, uh, with respect to the first set of classes. So uh, this may be explicitated somehow to the model or not through the availability, for example, or of a task label, but this is uh, may also not be the case. So I may want to solve this problem or partition, partition let's say, uh, problem, uh, for example, being able to distinguish all the different kinds of apples from, and, and then a, another problem which I want to distinguish um, different animals, and uh, but I don't give any uh, any point any step in po uh, in time uh, to my uh, continuous learning algorithm the notion of different tasks. Um, so this is also something that uh, you may want to check. Um, and uh, based on all these four different key settings, you may see here in the in the in this uh, this table a couple, let's say, of uh, interesting scenarios that were explored and are being explored uh, in continual learning and how they differ based on these different key uh, settings. So the first one being the class incremental uh, scenario in which. We don't have uh, actually the notion of task. Uh, we're, we are solving a unique classification problem. So we encounter a set of new classes for every experience that we've never seen before. And we would like to distinguish examples belonging to these classes, all the classes we have seen uh, so far. So this is clearly a unique classification problem 
we don't have class uh, task labels and uh, uh, we 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 encounter just uh, uh, new classes in the, for every um, experience that we are processing and uh, and we have yes the notion of task boundaries embedded in the very definition of the scenario where for each um, um, experience we have uh, a particular set of classes and then we move to a different completely different distribution of another different set of classes so the second i guess uh, very um common uh i guess even more common um scenario even in uh, especially in the past is what's called the task incremental scenario uh, in which instead you have this notion of tasks actually you're trying to solve a sequence of well-defined tasks over time you have then a clear notion of task boundaries so for every experience you're processing a different task and um you encounter of course every time new classes because you have completely new um and you separate orthogonal probably you you want to solve possibly and the problem is of course parti partitioned in a sense because you 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 have this notion of tasks and you want to uh, you can solve with a single model these different um tasks and then we have uh, the domain incremental uh, setting in which you don't have um, a, a notion of task here as well um, and uh, but at the same time um, boundaries are assumed to be present uh, again for each experience um, and in each of those experiences you may find uh, you may find um, uh, a set of examples of the same classes you have seen before so even since the first experience for example you're trying to recognize 50 different objects and uh, you you see them in very different environmental conditions uh, each each condition uh, let's say um, environmental condition related to a different experience you may encounter over time and so you want to improve your ability to recognize these objects in different uh, settings in different environmental conditions or um, to follow the nomenclature here of, of the scenario in different domains and this problem uh, in this case the problem is unique because uh, we, we cannot separate uh, um, the classification uh, problem in different subparts but we need to distinguish each class from the rest of the available ones. So the, the there are Pardon many cancel. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I just one second because I cannot uh, hear you yeah. well. Uh, let me fix the audio. Um, one second. Yes, no problem. OK, now I can hear. Can you hear me? Okay, there is one question uh, in the chat from Ahmad um, who asks if these different uh, continual learning scenarios are all built um, around a specific need or not. Uh, so basically, uh, we, which need each one uh, uh, answers to. And then if there is a difference uh, in training in terms of, of efficiency in training a policy uh, with multiple data sets sequentially or with different uh, uh, tasks uh, given one after the other over the previously poly uh, trained policies. So maybe uh, the first part is uh, is easier to, to answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so let me answer to the first uh, question and the second one, uh, uh, I would need yeah. a, a better clarification. But yeah. um, okay, so the first one, um, so, so exactly um, the, for example, these three main um, types of the, uh, scenarios that we discussed up to now, so class incremental, task incremental, the domain incremental, they somehow try to uh, tackle a very different kind of problems, right? So in, in the first one, you, you're trying to solve um, a single problem, a single task, and you want to expand, let's say, the, the concepts you're handling within this task over time. So different classes that are added and, and these may be linked um, to more, let's say, of uh, industrial, let's say, cases, for example, I don't know, um, uh, if you're uh, developing um, 
uh, an online system that is classifying uh, images uploaded by some kind of users, or you may be um, you may be uh, are uh, you, you want to develop a robot that, that, that should recognize objects in a real domestic environment. And so you need the system that should be able to add new classes, let's say a batch of new um, objects that you want to learn over time. Um, then, of course, there are limitations, and uh, and I guess there we can open a debate about these about each of these possible scenarios, um, and we're going to discuss in particular limitations about class incremental in, in a few uh, slides. Um, then the task incremental setting is more about you know learning uh, big tasks um, that uh, that you um, uh, have access maybe to over time. And uh, and uh, being able to uh, let's say um, use uh, let's say what we have previously learned to be more effective in in the real mm -hmm. solution of a task you encounter later, um, and so this is um, this is one of the first scenarios that was let's say developed that is very easy to to make and to develop right uh, as a collection of different, for example adapt the sets uh, in uh, in um, object recognition and computer vision and and but it's, it's still difficult to um, let's say understand the real uh, let's say uh, let's say the, the applicability of, of these tasks were in real world situations mm -hmm. uh, well for the domain incremental um, case I think this is a, a bit more um, aligned with some um, objectives related to continual learning agents that is um, having a, a single agent like the one that I uh, described before in a specific context where the classes and the, the environments is, is fixed somehow, but you want to um, update somehow uh, the its ability to 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 um, solve a particular task based on 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 the exposure to different domains, different situations, different conditions that uh, that the agent can only access over time. Um, so I don't know if this answers uh, somehow the, the the first question. Uh, what about what about the second again, Andrea? Uh, yeah, I also need maybe some clarifications for for the second because I think the main point was about to uh, the um, the efficiency when training a policy sequentially, so with multiple data sets, uh, for example, in the number of uh, patterns or uh, efficiency in the number of uh, training in the training time. Uh, so I think this is maybe a more general question that requires a bit of uh, uh, knowledge about the different approaches in continual learning before being mm -hmm. able to compare uh, yeah. the results. But I don't know if I'm getting the question right. So uh, just in case, uh, Mohamed, feel free to uh, speak up and uh, provide uh, more details. OK, yeah. So, so what I suggest is, uh, uh, let's oh, okay. say you wrote in the chat that now uh, is uh, is clear. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, <laughs> okay. So let's move on. Uh, then. Uh, okay. Um, okay. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, no. Maybe. Uh, not. Not. Mm, uh, you cannot see me anymore, right? So. Uh, <laughs> strange. Okay, I'm not able to to recover the web camera. I don't know why uh, Microsoft Teams decided that I cannot uh, uh, use my camera anymore. Well, let's move on then. Um, so, um, and let's look to to a possible categorization. So we 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 have. Uh, Discuss the fact that it's it's quite difficult nowadays to provide a comprehensive and uh, general um, categorization that would be somehow also reasonably, let's say, uh, shared across the community. Um, and this is uh, totally normal, uh, normal given the let's say use of uh, the continual learning field, especially with the deep learning community. And uh, and but 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 
if we we add to 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 stick to one possible categorization, then I think that this one uh, that uh, we proposed in uh, in um, the paper continuous learning for robotics, and you can see at the bottom of of uh, this um, uh, slide, may be um, uh, let's say um, a clarifying one, because uh, it is based on the um, idea that we can maybe define these scenarios just based on what the agent is actually seeing through the stream of experiences. So we, let's say, um, try to avoid uh, to, 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 to think of all the possible scenarios that you may want to tackle in continued learning and instead uh, uh, focusing on a definition of scenarios that is just based on the composition of the stream of experiences and what they contain. So it's essentially uh, what the agent sees. And um, so, so we define continual learning, if you recall, as um, uh, a continual learning algorithm as uh, with the, um, let's say, uh, with the following signature. So uh, being able to process experiences as well as um, uh, additional task labels that may be connected somehow related to these experiences. Um, so based on these uh, uh, task labels, we may think of defining three possible, um, um, let's say, main um, scenarios. That is uh, the multitask, single incremental task, and multiple incremental task um, setting. So um, here you can see uh, below this table um, a summary of just by looking at the different uh, task labels of your task stream, uh, your experiences, uh, stream of experiences, you may, um, let's say, automatically, automatically detect if you are in a single incremental task, a multitask, and a multiple incremental task. So for a single incremental task, you're seeing that the task label is the same for all the experiences. OK, so uh, this is the same as saying that there is no notion of task. Uh, and this is uh, in line with what we, we wanted to, to, to say as well, right? So we are just solving a single task and the agent doesn't have actually a notion of task. Um, um, or if it has, it's just the, the, the same for all the experiences. So. Um, it cannot leverage somehow uh, this information to tweak the, the continuous learning algorithm and to and to make it work uh, in um, um, uh, you know customizing the behaviors of, of the of the agent. Um, then uh, for the multitask setting, we say that the task label is different for all the diff all the possible experiences. And the full the multiple incremental task, um, we are in a situation in which, we may find um, like a repetition of task labels over time um, across our uh, stream of experiences. And um, so, so in the end, uh, we, we are able to, to model quite nicely um, these different scenarios just by looking at the task labels and their availability to the agent. Then if we look at the different content, um, uh, of each experience. Uh, for example, if there are new examples related to the same classes, or if we have new classes, um, uh, the, of, you know, ex examples of new classes we have never seen before, or both examples of uh, classes we have seen before and classes we have never seen before, then we can, uh, let's say, start looking at a different dimension of this classification, this categorization um, about the experience content type um, with these three different columns, a new and I, new instances, and C, new classes, and NIC, new instances and classes. And you can see that based on this uh, categorization, you can, you can uh, define the other let's say main, um, let's say three, four um, scenarios that we discussed even before. So task incremental, domain incremental, class incremental, then have these, uh, let's say more general data incremental scenario in which we do not pose a lot of constraints in the 
kind of data that you encounter, but you don't have notion of, of a task essentially. And um, and you may have both let's say examples of uh, classes uh, seen before and new class and new classes uh, that you've never seen before. And what's interesting is that you, there are also spaces in, in say that, that unexplored areas that have not let's say yet been uh, labeled with a particular scenario name, but are, they may be still interesting uh, for some um, uh, future applications uh, of continued learning. However, this categorization is uh, by itself not comprehensive enough. And uh, for example, it doesn't take into account um, the idea of having multiple tasks within the same experience that may happen, right? In some applications, you may have an agent that is requested to update its knowledge about the external world based on data related to different tasks in, in, it has to learn at the same time. OK, so let's uh, um, quickly move to, um, let's say, a, a quick overview of the common benchmarks that you may find in Codeo Learning. Oh, before that, let's just clarify um, a bit the notation. I mean, the, the nomenclature we're going to use uh, from now on uh, in this course, as well as in the Avalanche library. So um, what's the difference uh, in terms of data sets, scenarios, and benchmarks? Because <laughs> these are often, let's say, confused in continual learning and may pose some, um, some uh, um, peculiar, let's say, misunderstandings. Uh, so uh, what we mean by data set is just a collection of examples, just a collection of examples um, related to, to a particular, let's say, distribution task or whatever. Um, then with the scenario, we mean the specific settings that are somehow constraining or describing um, how uh, the, the stream of experiences is composed and to which constraints uh, it, it, it is based on. For example, for the cross-incremental scenario, we have three main constraints. The fact that each uh, experience contains only examples of new classes never seen before, with clear boundaries for each of these uh, experiences. We don't have uh, the availability of task uh, labels during train or test. And uh, we are in the presence of a unique classification problem. So once we have a particular data set, for example, the MNIST data set uh, we have seen in the previous lecture, and the, the class incremental learning scenario, then what we can create just uh, putting them together is a particular benchmark, what we call a particular benchmark, which is exactly the combination of a data set and a particular scenario. Then, of course, you may uh, argue at this point that, well, you can create multiple versions of this benchmark based on the same data set and the same um, uh, scenario. This is exactly true, is that indeed, um, we talk in this case um, about benchmark instances. So, for example, uh, for, for the split MNIST benchmark, it is essentially the class incremental learning uh, setting uh, scenario uh, used with MNIST. Then um, you may define like a possible sequence of five experiences, uh, each of those containing two classes each. For example, the first experience uh, with zero one, the second one with two, three, and so on and so forth. But you may also uh, find different uh, uh, ways of, of creating a, a split of these benchmark, for example, with uh, a different amount of experiences um, or uh, a different order in terms of the classes that are that you encounter in these experiences. Uh, so still somehow um, um, uh, responding and answering to the specifics of the class incremental scenarios, but um, um, you know, um, 
creating different alternatives uh, on, uh, on, on what is that the scenario is not constraining uh, the benchmark to be. So for, ex for example, um, um, you may have, again, different benchmark instances just by changing the order of, of the experiences. So for example, if you have two experiences, E1 and E2, then a uh, completely different, let's say, benchmark instance would be as to we just E2 as the first experience and E1 as the second one. Okay. So um, uh, this table is, is a bit outdated, uh, uh, well, outdated, I guess, because um, uh, it, it was, um, let's say, uh, brought down a couple of years ago, but, and the field is, is moving um, very, very uh, fast. But you can uh, quickly see from from uh, from a nice um, from a, from a quick glance over this table that um, the main focus of the recent continuous learning, deep continuous learning research, has mostly been on on computer vision tasks, and this is totally understandable, given the, the fact that um, um, well, it, it is reasonably easier to work within uh, the deep learning. Um, in, on uh, computer vision tasks are much more explored and, and uh, for which there are a lot of interesting data sets available for easing prototyping and uh, um, and uh, and exploring different dimensions even of, of the learning uh, of different learning partings and um, and also you know historically um, um, because it it was um, in the I mean continual learning deep continual learning was indeed more explored within the computer vision community. Um, uh, so uh, we have seen already uh, a couple of those uh, common um, uh, benchmarks like split MNIST and rotation MNIST. Oh uh, no, maybe not rotation MNIST, but you guess it's another uh, um, transformation applied to MNIST that would enable you to create a benchmark, a deep learning benchmark with different uh, uh, rotation angles for each of the examples belonging to the different experiences. And uh, then we have seen also the permutation of this um, case. And there are there are other, let's say, common splits like with Cypher 10 and 100. They could get the combination of those. Um, then we have um, what we will describe in more detail uh, later, the Core 50 data set and other uh, common, let's say, state of the art object recognition data sets such as ImageNet. Um, and uh, so I invite you to check out the paper and the table in the paper if you want to look at the different um, um, references that we listed here as use cases, uh, let's say application of those uh, benchmarks and um, also looking at the different uh, support for the new instances, new classes and new instances and classes, let's say cases. So, um, so the, the content type of the experiences. Okay, so um, to try to summarize what's been like the, the, the main, um, um, let's say, drive and, and uh, focus on uh, uh, benchmarks, uh, continuous learning benchmarks in the recent past, I have to say that the, the, the community started uh, uh, with a, 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 a bit emphasis and focus on multitask settings, multitask in a sense that um, uh, we encounter a sequence of tasks over time, and for each of the experiences, uh, you have a different task. And so, for for these first explorations, we were talking about just a few and a few um, um, big tasks um, that you well-defined tasks that would be also what I call ID by parts. So, the idea that you have these tasks by that by themselves. They are, they are, they are, uh, they have an ID sampling. So um, essentially, it's 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 um, kind of a, of a very simplified um, continual learning scenario because you you, you may um, um, learn within tasks with uh, with the standard, let's say, machine learning techniques, um, since you have this um, ID data. And then you would need only to find, um, um, let's say, some heuristics to be able to use the same uh, weights um, and uh, the same model to tackle different tasks um, over time. And 
These explorations were mostly concerned and were realized on uh, say mostly unrealistic toy data sets like the MNIST one, and they were mostly focused on supervised learning techniques and uh, based on accuracy metrics uh, of the performance. With uh, the current focus instead of uh, continuous learning, I think um, um, maybe linked to um, the exploration of classic incremental learning. Uh, so it was somehow shown uh, empirically that class incremental learning it is more difficult than uh, task incremental learning in general um, due to the fact that uh, let's say this is more of a, a natural exposure to completely different distributions and different classes um, would uh, with standard let's say deep learning approaches um, impact more on the forgetting and the catastrophic interference so there was kind of a of a more difficult and more uh, interesting problem to tackle for for many researchers in this area but the problem in in this case is still that uh um, we are focusing on on just a handful of experiences a dozens uh, of those and we we still have this problem of, of the experiences that contain data that are, are not let's say temporally related and are, are are essentially id and uh, um, most of the times for each experience you have uh, a significant amount of data um, from which you you can learn um, uh, new concepts um, so uh, the main data sets used for these cases uh, are still uh, mostly unrealistic and uh, even though we are moving towards more and more uh, and, uh, complex uh, data sets and it tickling more of a real world um, uh, problems uh, um, day by day. The problem uh, in, with current focus is, that, is still that we are pretty much focused on supervised learning and still uh, too much focused on the single accuracy metric or you know single performance metrics with respect to the, uh, the basic offline let's say strategy joint training strategy we have discussed briefly in uh, in the second lecture. But the problem with the um, with class incremental learning is that uh, we 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 cannot uh, revisit somehow we assume that we cannot revisit previously seen classes and this is uh, somehow not uh, not really natural uh, isn't it so we we are discussing a continual learning problem so um, of an agent that as to learn um, a sequence um, of from a sequence of experiences containing different uh, classes, and uh, but we are never going to encounter them again. So the, the question may 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 be at this point. So why are we learning these um, classes uh, at all if you're not going to encounter them again? Um, oh yes. Um, more in general, I think that allowing for repetition um, would not only, um, in let's say, impact on less forgetting, because uh, we have some kind of replay, re from the real environment, but may be useful um, as, uh, as an important source of information, so a structure in the world as is telling us what's important and what is not. And so we discussed this also previously uh, in uh, the introduction of the concept of forgetting for humans, how uh, the frequencies of the occurrences and you know, the repetition of concepts impacts indeed on the consolidation um, algorithm that our brain is somehow implementing. So usually repetition allows also for longer streams, so you know more naturally uh, natural streams of data, so with more experiences. So I think that um, for the future, being able to move, um, let's say, uh, forward with, with respect to the classic class incremental scenario would be an interesting uh, development for our field. And uh, I think that class incremental with repetition would be a very interesting uh, settings. Um, and for this, we, we are working with Andrea here and, and other people um, to a paper that should be should appear soon uh, um, and name this class incremental enough for continued learning. Um, so what's next? Then uh, uh, class incremental with repetition may be an interesting venue for future research. 
Um, but more in general, I think that we should really try in uh, in benchmarking uh, continue learning algorithms to be a bit more uh, relaxed in terms of uh, assumptions that we make and constraints so that we can really start thinking and let's say developing um, theory and uh, algorithms that can work on more general settings, more general situations, more portable uh, situations. And uh, um, so we could um, even stick to this, let's say to settings in which we have, we don't have the notion of a task since we know that the core, um, let's say the core issue and uh, uh, well, maybe the core objective of continual learning is to learn continually robust representations from a non-ID stream of data. So we, we don't actually need the notion of task, even though it may be useful for uh, downstream, um, let's say, problems that we, we may want to solve, we, we continue learning. I think it would be worth instead focusing on the main uh, core issues of continual learning and uh, with this um, idea and vision in mind. And uh, instead focusing on, uh, on then on, 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 on highly uh, non-ID stream of data, uh, possibly i-dimensional, uh, as we know, uh, is uh, the, the perceptual realm, uh, and possibly with more natural and realistic data sets um, that are uh, mostly unsupervised, so we don't have additional and explicit um, labels accompanying our stream of data. Uh, this is uh, much more in line with the natural streams that we can already gather from uh, uh, unsupervised sources. And the focus in terms of metrics uh, and evaluation should be instead on scalability and efficiency. So uh, we should re really focus on systems that are able to scale in terms of intelligence while being sustainable and efficient in terms of uh, computation and memory resources we deploy to, to, to them. Because um, even though at the end of our let's say, experiment, we can say that, uh, okay, the accuracy performance uh, is uh, way less than an offline joint train strategy. If we can prove that our continuous learning algorithm is able to improve over time, then it, it, this, this is uh, indeed interesting because it may uh, uh, also suggest that if exposed to an unlimited number of experiences, this uh, algorithm will be able to learn continually and improve over time. Um, so I think that the focus should be more, mostly on these metrics in the future, even though uh, we will discuss uh, in the next lecture how um, um, you know different metrics are already being proposed and different evaluation schemes um, are, are ready to play to, to make this uh, a reality in, in the near term. Okay, just to um, conclude before the break, um, I wanted to just show you um, uh, a couple of interesting benchmarks that uh, we could use uh, for the next, let's say, generation of continuous learning algorithms. And I think that, um, especially if you want to stick with computer vision, there are already a, a number of uh, interesting uh, natural benchmarks that you can use um, for continuous learning. And they are already uh, video benchmarks, so they provide you a way uh, to create your stream of experiences in a way that um, you, you I mean in a, in a way that you can you can model these uh, stream uh, and then make it a very uh, non-ID and um, I dimensional and uh, I think that for those um, stream 41 open lorries and they cap transformation are three uh, great examples uh, you may find more details about these in the relative papers that I linked at the bottom of the slide. Um, so, uh, just again, I want to stress the importance, let's say, of having uh, not only uh, different data that you can process over time, uh, but also data that are, that are, let's say, examples into your experiences um, that are, let's say, temporal correlated. So, um, we mentioned already these, these are two orthogonal concepts, right? So, this idea that uh, learning continually and um, uh, sequence learning are two different uh, paradigms that I hope they will converge in, in the in the future. But um, 
I think that uh, working with the streams of, of data that are naturally, let's say, uh, temporary correlated may be um, a nice way to, to, to make a step forward towards this uh, these, um, these sure vision. Um, and uh, having temporary um, tempora coherent data uh, may also help us to somehow uh, reduce the amount of supervision we give to our systems. Uh, since we know a lot of different unsupervised learning techniques, they exploit, let's say, the temporal structure um, uh, to 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 do self-supervised learning or or um, just to 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 learn without uh, specific, um, uh, um, let's say, class labels. Okay, and then uh, um, here you can see what uh, we introduced uh, briefly also in the previous lecture. Is these, uh, let's say. Um, um, data set core 50 that is uh, one of the first uh, benchmarks ever proposed specifically designed for continual learning and uh, object recognition detection and segmentation so if you're interested you may want to, to check it out uh, we proposed this in uh, 2017 and you will find uh, an interesting uh, uh, website with all the details about uh, the data set uh, if you just um, search it on google uh, and you may we also be able to find it in in avalanche um, as we will see in the, in, the, in a few minutes okay so i think that uh, we can uh, um, have a short five minute breaks um, and um, and uh, and then we will regroup and we will have we will start with the second part of the lecture about um, the Avalanche Benchmarks module and a nice hands-on session uh, trying to understand how we can use it and how you can use it for your own experiments. <laughs> right, welcome back to the um, third, second part of the third uh, lecture of this uh, continuing learning course. Um, so now we're going to explore how you can um, build your benchmarks using Avalanche, uh, our end-to-end -end library for continual learning, and how you can actually use Avalanche um, to find uh, already implemented benchmarks uh, that are available for you and are commonly used within our continual learning uh, literature. So, um, I will start with a brief introduction to the benchmarks module and then we will move to the um, hands on, let's say, Google Colab notebook that uh, we prepared for you. Um, so, the benchmarks module is kind of a standalone, independent uh, module from the other ones. Uh, so, if you recall, this image is the operative, let's say, skeleton of Avalanche with the five different main modules of it uh, depicted at the top of this image. And so benchmarks is the, is the first one. I guess it's a fundamental block here because it's in charge of generating the stream of experiences as we would define it uh, before. So this module will be in charge uh, to, of, uh, let's say, uh, giving you the basic utilities to create your own uh, stream of experiences as well as providing, uh, let's say, classic benchmarks that you can already use and are already available for you without writing a single line of code. And the benchmarks module is pretty much independent from the rest of Avalanche in a sense because you can use uh, its utils um, without necessarily delve too much into the rest of Avalanche and uh, just to you know, use it somehow to create this stream of experiences you can then process uh, as you deem uh, more appropriate. And um, it contains, of course, many uh, out-of-the-box tools uh, and nice, let's say, uh, goodies on top of uh, the, 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 the uh, utilities already developed within uh, within PyTorch. So in a sense, for example, it expands uh, the basic data loader and uh, um, data set uh, utilities uh, to better suit the continual learning case, uh, among many other things. Uh, and so the main idea of the benchmarks module was to, was to provide maximum flexibility. So we really want you to be able to create uh, any 
possible stream of experiences. Uh, so without any constraints about the kind of benchmarks you should uh, attain to uh, kind of main settings that uh, defines it. No, just the, the basic building blocks to give you the ability to create your own stream of, exp uh, of experiences of data in the order you, you, you think it's appropriate to model your problem. And this, of course, is an exceptional time saver because it really makes transparent to you all the annoying, I would say, uh, writing of the scripts to download the data and uh, to process, reprocess them uh, and to load them uh, fast enough uh, and, uh, you know, all these things that I guess uh, many of you already experimented in your in your life as a, as a PhD and um, and it's very daunting and it really something that uh, uh, is not you should you should really concern your main at least activity during uh, your um, PhD that would be instead being focused on the ideas and the vision in, in the algorithms um, okay so um, the benchmarks module um, offer many tools. Uh, the main thing is uh, the data loading procedures and uh, the ability to generate a stream of data, as we mentioned. Uh, but apart from those, let's say, two main uh, basic uh, core um, uh, aspects and uh, features, um, it also provides uh, a lot of out of the box, let's say, um, uh, features like these classic benchmarks. So, a set of benchmarks that are commonly used in continuous learning, for example, split and list that we have seen before, Core 50, uh, Stream 51, and, um, you know, uh, giving you um, uh, objects, let's say, classes, Python classes that you can instantiate. Uh, directly to create with just a few parameters you need to, to give when you instantiate this class uh, to create object instances that are essentially benchmark uh, instances as we defined uh, before. So that's really cool because you don't, you don't need to write, if, if there is like a common, let's say, shared benchmarks in our community, uh, then you don't need to rewrite it somehow. You can just instantiate it and you, then you can use it as you would do with any other uh, benchmark in Avalanche. Um, then, of course, uh, a fourth uh, but not less important uh, uh, aspect would be to let different users to create their own benchmarks. Um, so um, here we offer like a maximum compatibility, com compatibility with Torch Vision datasets, uh, mostly, but, but also with other, let's say, Torch datasets in general. And, uh, and so did you, we, we want to provide and we see how a set of, let's say, low level, uh, let's say, building uh, tools so that you can easily create a new benchmarks uh, from those. So this is an example of a classic benchmark where you can create a split and list that uh, I don't know if you tried, <laughs> but as a homework, uh, I left you last time this, uh, this exercise of uh, creating a split of uh, uh, MNIST using that uh, method that I created in the notebook and trying to apply some good learning, let's say, strategies um, or like basic naive strategies that we have uh, discussed very briefly um, during the, the lecture two. Uh, and try to to apply them and split them list. But um, here you, you you can see how easy it is uh, if you just want to use uh, the classic benchmarks um, um, uh, object definition of split them list. So you can you can just you can just give uh, the n number of experiences like five a particular C determining let's say all the let's say non uh, random choices in the benchmark instance and uh, of course you can you can add a lot of interesting set of uh, um, uh, you can give a lot of interesting set of uh, parameters to specify the benchmark instance for example if you want the task id to be returned for each of those experiences um, and uh, with this task id being different for each experience if you want to fix the class order uh, if you want to add uh, some transformations for training and evaluation, I mean, all, a lot of different uh, common uh, uh, things that you would need when you create uh, a new benchmark uh, instance for continual learning. 
And uh, each Bensmer instance may be composed of many streams. So um, that you will always get access to these two main streams. We are going to discuss the next uh, lecture uh, on the evaluation protocol. Why do we need two different let's say, parallel streams um, of data, one for the training, one for the task? Uh, but as for now, you can just assume that for each experience, you need somehow uh, a different uh, um, train and test set, right? Uh, so a benchmark instance indeed uh, give you access to these different uh, train streams um, uh, composed of the same number of experiences. And uh, it also supports custom streams. So you can also add new streams that you think are useful for your experiment. For example, um, uh, you want to assess the ability of your system to generalize on out of uh, distribution data. Um, and then, you, I mean, you can you can add your own, and this is pretty flexible within the definition of benchmarks in our launch. And so uh, a stream is composed of a sequence of experiences, each carrying a PyTorch data set, uh, additional task labels, and any other benchmark specific data. So we don't have constraints about this. But you, you see already how this is implemented. So uh, when you process an experience, you get access to essentially a PyTorch data set from which you can load efficiently your examples and from which you can train your system on. And um, so the basic look, loop, loop uh, based on these uh, um, benchmark instances will be the following one. So uh, first we get uh, the train and test streams. These are just two attributes of the benchmark instance object. For example, the, the previous one that we have instantiated as a split embedded benchmark instance. And then we can just loop over it, over the data set offered by, um, uh, sorry, we can loop over all the different experiences in the train stream uh, that as you would do, I guess, intuitively. Um, and so you get access to these different experiences one at a time, and each of those experiences have uh, a PyTorch data set you can access to the dot data set attribute. And once you have this data set, you can process this data that, that set um, as you would do normally with a static uh, problem. So uh, you get, uh, oh, for example, without uh, a data loader, PyTorch data loader, you can just iterate over the data set and you would get uh, this kind of uh, uh, triplet, so uh, uh, X, Y, T in general, but this may change, may, may contain a, a set of different, uh, uh, let's say, tensors uh, for depending on the data set definition, right? And uh, with T, of course, being the task uh, label for each pattern. And uh, um, so, so what we do, uh, what we can do is also to uh, test <clears throat> on the specific corresponding test experience in, uh, in the test stream using the ID corresponding to the experience of the train stream we are currently processing. Or we can also create uh, some additional, let's say, uh, uh, interesting, let's say, composition of experiences uh, test sets, like in this case, where we want to create a cumulative test with all the data of the test sets related to the current experience and the previous ones. This is some, somehow sometimes interesting and useful when you want to assess the ability of your model to perform well on previous uh, test sets and previous tasks. So as for custom uh, uh, benchmarks, we offer, let's say, two main ways to um, to, 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 to create your, your own uh, benchmark. So um, the first being a bit more high level, higher level, and the second one being a bit more uh, lower level. And for for both cases, we 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 use these words as generators. So we we call uh, we talk about benchmarks and generators um, um, uh, to uh, somehow describe high level or low level functions that given. Um, uh, a scenario, a data set can somehow create, generate a stream, a, a benchmark instance somehow. Uh, 
And uh, so for the first set, the wire level um, APIs, so what we have is a couple for now of um, inter interesting functions. So we have new classes, uh, a, a method to create essentially a class and task incremental um, uh, scenarios with this idea of, of adding new classes for each of the experiences and new instances as you may uh, 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 get ready is um, a, a function that generated that allows you to create benchmarks based on a particular setting and data set uh, based on the notion of having just few examples of the same classes for each of the experiments. And this is cool if you want to implement, for example, a domain incremental setting, that's scenario. Uh, but even much more than that, right? Um, and for if if you cannot somehow use this higher level more useful and, and uh, let's say powerful uh, functions and generators, you can use the lower level ones that allows you to just put together tensors, uh, file lists, or you know custom PyTorch datasets and create a bunch of marks just starting from those. So this is an example of the higher level API. Um, with split and list. So, so, so instead of using the classic benchmark, what we can do is to um, start from um, the NIST PyTorch dataset for the training and test, and then we can use this NC benchmark, that is this um, um, high level um, function generator I was mentioning before that given uh, these different uh, training and test sets, creates a number of experiences in which for each of those, you may have a different set of classes. You may encounter a different set of classes based also on the additional parameters you can list and you can check looking at the, uh, uh, let's say, at the um, API doc of Avalanche if you want to, to, to learn more about this function. Um, so again, uh, just to, to conclude this introduction was a bit uh, uh, long, but the Benchmarks uh, module in Avalanche is defined so that we give you the basic building blocks to create your own uh, streams of experiences, your benchmark instance, without any forced nomenclature of, uh, or, or uh, structured way of doing things. Um, and um, so this is more of a Pythonish, I would say, approach uh, to continual learning. And um, so the choices regarding task labels and the, the coherence of all of it are left to, to the benchmark creator, benchmark designer. And uh, task labels, uh, task labels can be defined at the experience level or also at pattern granularity. So the, it is really easy for this, with this module to create complex setups in very simple, in a very simple way with very simple tools. Okay, so I think that we can quickly move uh, very quickly at this point um, uh, to the, let's say, hands on session of the lecture. And uh, I will let you explore it a bit more in detail um, at all. But I wanted to give you just an idea on, on, uh, on how you can install Avalanche and uh, how you can play with the benchmarks module we just introduced. As always, you can. Uh, um, directly go on uh, Google Colab. And here to the GitHub tab, if you look for continual AI, you can get access to the continuous avalanche data set in this case, not the column one. And you can have access to a list of possible notebooks that we created for avalanche. You're going to explore during this, uh, this course. So here uh, we use the benchmarks uh, uh, notebook. So you can run it and uh, you uh, directly have access to um, a virtual machine that has been set up for you on Google Colab. Then you click on run anyway. It's safe, I promise. <laughs> 
And so the first thing that we do is to install Avalanche. So the, installing Avalanche today is as simply as using a pip command. Uh, so even though we do not yet provide a version, uh, let's say, and packaged version on pip and conda, you can install it to, to GitHub uh, directly. So this is easy to do. And uh, and after just a couple of seconds, all the dependencies of Avalanche are installed. And since here PyTorch is already installed, we don't have any problem with that. And, uh, and we can start using it. Uh, but yes, if instead you want to install it on a normal, let's say, machine, then uh, your own machine, your computer, then you need to install PyTorch before, I think. Uh, but yes, uh, everything is well explained in the Avalanche uh, website where you should be able to find here uh, an how to install, let's say, guide here in the getting start section. Okay. Okay, but if you have to run it, just on a notebook, this pip install is enough. And so after clarifying a bit the nomenclature as we did in our um, introduction uh, of the Benchrex module, then what it shows is just um, a couple of possibilities. So starting from, you know, this idea of, of, of having access to a number of PyTorch datasets that are collected within the benchmarks.datasets um, uh, sub package. Uh, so here we you see a lot of different data sets that were already available in PyTorch, as well as additional ones like the Core 50 data set and uh, a few more that uh, are commonly open lorries that we are commonly used in uh, in the Codeo learning. So we decided to provide a data set, PyTorch data set for them as well. And here, as you can imagine, you can go through and use these data sets as you would normally do with PyTorch. So you can instantiate them, you can iterate among, uh, uh, over them, uh, you can use the data loader on top of them, and, uh, and this gives you the same uh, results, final results. Okay, so, so you, you can, of course, you, you don't have to stick with these specific data sets. You can create your own as you would do in PyTorch, and then you can use the, let's say, generators that we, we discussed in a second uh, to create your own, let's say, stream of experiences benchmark, continue learning benchmark. Uh, so to create your PyTorch benchmark, you can use these different uh, PyTorch utils that also contain, uh, I don't remember if they're just PyTorch or, or we developed from scratch them. But yes, you have a, a sequence of uh, a series of possible uh, utils here that will help you to create a data set uh, starting from a folder of images or data um, and uh, uh, then a general uh, say folder containing uh, data um, a file list uh, describing where to find each of the examples and the relative class and uh, uh, this is something that we added uh, uh, the, the Avalanche data is a more powerful, let's say, PyTorch data set in general. Okay, so um, here you can see a couple of, of uh, interesting things and, and attributes of uh, the benchmark, of the, the usage of, of the classic benchmarks. So in this case, again, split and list, you can import it simply as uh, from Avalanche, uh, dot benchmarks, dot classic import split and list and you and you are able to uh, create a benchmark instance simply by um, uh, specifying number of experiences a couple more uh, parameters then with this split and list you can get access to the or even to the original train and test set using these uh, special attributes you can get access to a number of interesting uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, contents uh, like this train, exper uh, um, exp uh, patterns assignment. So um, the patterns of the original data and how they have been assigned to each of the experiences in the stream. Uh, the same you can do with the test uh, stream. Um, then the, the access to the eventual task labels defined 
um, uh, at the level in this case of the, the benchmark instance, so we will get access to a list um, and uh, the different streams available, for example, the training test sims, uh, the classes in, its, in each experience, and so on and so forth. So you have a lot of interesting attributes that you can use to, to simplify, let's say, as much as possible your experience in developing a new uh, experiment in continual learning. And so you, you can see the results that you would expect uh, the mapping uh, so the, the, of the, the different patterns uh, ID and uh, the um, different task labels in this case, just the same for all the different five experiences in the stream. So going towards the train and test streams, uh, uh, what's nice about these test streams is that they are fully sliceable and reordable and indexable so you can use them as a simple list in python and you can get access to the specific subset of experiences so this is really cool and so given the fact that you have a stream of experiences no one forces you to process these experiences one at a time as you encounter them you can actually process them in different orders you can change and tweak them and this is because we again we are really, um, we really want to give you the maximum uh, um, uh, flexibility and expressivity power to do uh, your own stuff, right? <laughs> with uh, we continue learning, and even for you know for this uh, um, um, train and test stream, you you can you can have also an indirect, let's say, uh, link to the originating benchmark. This may be useful in some cases. <laughs> Okay, then uh, uh, for the experiences, uh, we go down this, uh, this road, right? Uh, more and more granular. So we have seen the benchmark instance, uh, then we have seen the streams, and now we are looking at the experiences. Even for the experiences, you have access to a, a lot of interesting uh, uh, attributes. Uh, the main important uh, aspects here is that is the task label and, uh, and data set attributes. So the task label will be a task label that has been defined at the level of the experience instead of single patterns, single examples in the, in the experiences. And the data set is the PyTorch data set from which you can load these examples related to the experience. And each experience has a, a, a lot more um, interesting information that you can recover easily, like the current, like the ID, let's say, of the current experience. The classes uh, that you can see in the current experience, experience, the classes so far, the previous classes, future classes you're going to encounter, uh, the original, uh, let's say, uh, the stream from which the experience has been taken, and the original benchmark from which these, uh, these experiences have been taken through the stream. And so, uh, once you, you, you have access to the data set, of course, you can, as we mentioned already, you can uh, loop over this data set you normally do in PyTorch. Okay, see, so here is, I show also just a number of possible classic uh, benchmarks that you can define in, uh, in, uh, in Avalanche. They are not, uh, I mean, all the ones that we offer, and we should update this, but but it's it's uh, just an example of how you can use them like with permuted at least. And so at the end, uh, what we can do is to have a, a, let's say a continual learning experiment script that is essentially the, the, the one that you can see. So uh, once we have defined a specific benchmark instance and we have recovered the, the train and test stream, then what we want to do in our experiment is to just loop over the different experiences. This is the main assumption of continuing learning, right? So the fact that we want to access one ex experience at a time, and uh, then uh, for each of those experiments, we can recover the corresponding data set, PyTorch data set. We, we can do our magic here and, uh, and uh, the train of this data set, a specific uh, uh, learning strategy. And then we can recover, let's say, the metrics that we're interested about uh, with respect to a particular, uh, let's say, uh, test um, uh, on, on, uh, on a subset or a particular portion of the test stream. Well, see, in this case, we just recovered the current test set and then we assume that uh, we will see how we can evaluate on this tree. 
Okay, so in terms of benchmarks in the data, or just in the last few minutes that we have available, sorry for the delay, um, then uh, as I mentioned, we offer at the moment two main uh, high level benchmark generator that are the new classes and 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 I benchmark uh, generator. So um, here you can see an example on how you can actually create a split MNIST uh, that as a benchmark uh, without using the classic benchmark object already defined for you, but using uh, the high level uh, NC benchmark um, function. So in this case, oh, sorry, in this case, we, we use the NI. So we're not uh, uh, creating the split MNIST uh, benchmark in this case, but just a, uh, an MNIST, let's say, scenario uh, that is following a domain incremental definition, right? So in this case, um, we just give to the NI benchmark function the train and test set a couple more information about, uh, let's say, how we want uh, these uh, experiences to be and the stream to be. And then we can loop over this stream that has been uh, created for us, right? That would be really nice if you want to stick to this basic, let's say, uh, definition of, of streams. And so if you want to do the actual split MNIST, so more of a class incremental uh, definition, you may say, for example, okay, I give to the NC benchmark generator MNIST train and MNIST stress, a test. I want 10 different experiences. Uh, so automatically, e e the, this uh, NC benchmark function, uh, uh, let's say, creates an evenly split of the classes available, or the 10 classes available for uh, MNIST two for each experience, and we also ask to not provide any label to, to within the stream, right? So we don't want to create, a, to, to have any labels. We are in a class incremental uh, setting, so we, we want to treat the stream as just um, um, a single task. We, we want to solve a unique classification problem. And you can do the same with this, so you can get access to the trace stream and loop over it, as we mentioned before. And just to conclude, uh, maybe you can uh, look at these more carefully at home. Uh, you can use different uh, different uh, low-level benchmarks, depending on the specific uh, uh, data that you that you have that you may have, and from which you you can start from. So if you if you have your your uh, uh, let's say experiences already defined as file lists, uh, as it was. Uh, common in the past with the CAFE, for example, the CAFE framework. So let's say file lists, um, let's say file containing a list of paths and labels. Um, so uh, essentially where to find the, 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 the example and, uh, and what class it belongs to. Um, and so you may use this file list benchmark. So if you instead uh, want to create these paths uh, directly, uh, you know, with a script or uh, uh, you have it in RAM, then you can use directly the paths benchmark uh, generator that gives you the ability to create a benchmark instance just based on a sequence of paths and classes directly specified as Python objects. And then you have dataset benchmark that allows you to create uh, a continuous learning benchmark just by providing to this method a set of uh, data sets, PyTorch data sets, that will constitute different experiences. Or, as you may imagine, Tensor's benchmark gives you the ability to provide different tensors and then specify the experiences directly as different tensors in, uh, in PyTorch. So I think you can root, read through the, 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 the end of this tutorial where I just try to show you how you can use these different uh, uh, low-level benchmark generators. Um, so I think that we can conclude this uh, today lecture here, and I will be now available to answer some of your questions. Any questions? Okay, I think that uh, there are no main questions, so I will uh, create uh, uh, the main thread for keeping the discussion open on uh, the forum, and uh, I will try to upload these. Um, uh, sorry, I have a question, can I? 
Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, hello, and thank you for the nice lecture. Uh, actually, I have a question about the benchmarking tool. So, for example, if uh, it creates new instances uh, based uh, based on the MNIST, are they uh, synthetic instances or instances um, uh, from the data set that uh, it isn't being seen by the algorithm by far? So if you're referring to the, let's say, this high level NI benchmark uh, generator, in that case, it doesn't create um, any new data that is already present in the uh, original data set, but, but is only based on the idea of splitting the examples into the different experiences um, so that they can maintain somehow uh, the representation for all the classes. So, for example, in MNIST, uh, if you look at the, the noted book, you see that um, uh, for each of the exper experiences, you can find all the different end classes, but you will see that there are just a, a lower number of examples that you would expect with a, a training set, the training set of MNIST uh, for each of those experiences. So, for each of the experiment experiences, you will find uh, around 6,000 training example. That, that if you multiply by 10, you get to the actual number of training examples in any list. Okay, then this is just the uh, splitting and the order of the samples being fed yeah, to the yeah. algorithm. So yeah. I, 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 I suppose uh, for the uh, class case, it's also like this. We, we For example, we cannot have uh, other new instances, for example, for, with the 11th class. <laughs> it's only 10 classes and... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so if you want to, to go towards the, the, the other direction of, uh, let's say, augmenting the data set, you can do that uh, via transformations uh, before uh, using maybe other uh, low level uh, benchmarks generator. So for those two, NI and NC, they, they, they work directly on also multiple, multiple data sets. So if you have multiple data sets, even created by a single, let's say, original source, you can use these, but they assume that they won't create for you additional examples, okay? So if you want to achieve that goal, uh, you may want to create, uh, let's say, alternative new versions, new, uh, let's say, data sets. For example, for MNIST, you want to create, uh, um, uh, let's say, a uh, transformated data set with a rotation of the images enforced, right? Yes, so once you have this rotation in place, you can have, you can pass to the NI or NC benchmarks generator these two data sets, and uh, then the NC, for example, method would take charge just on the splitting, not in the generation of the new examples. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other question? There is a question from Gianpaolo about any uh, homework for next lesson. Ah, okay, well, that that's uh, nice. So I, I think that um, if you want, uh, you can uh, take a deeper look at uh, this uh, this notebook that we didn't have the time to explore in depth uh, and slowly. So that's uh, important. And also, you may want to look at the um, how tos we call them. So different how-tos on how to use these, um, let's say, more advanced features of in Avalanche, such as the Avalanche data set. Uh, so um, at the moment, we don't have them on the main official website, but they will appear in, in possibly tomorrow by the end of today. So uh, you may want to check those. Uh, there are three additional notebooks that you may run on Colab that are essentially all about the Avalanche data set and what you can do with these uh, very interesting, uh, uh, let's say, wrapping uh, class for the main uh, data set um, util in PyTorch. Uh, otherwise, you may always uh, um, look at, uh, to the um, additional materials that Andrea and, and me and other are somehow um, filling into the additional materials section of the main course website. Okay, in the meanwhile, um, that you write your questions in the chat if you have any more of them. I just wanted to um, remind you all that 
we won't have um, a lecture on the 8th of December as was originally planned because it's uh, like a um, uh, vacation day in Italy and we are going to move the lecture from the 8th to the 9th uh, at the same time. So same link, everything unchanged. Uh, but yes, will be the next day. And uh, yes, we, we are going to keep these, uh, uh, these, um, uh, the, the next lecture also uh, uh, only remote. And uh, I hope to see you in class uh, by the next week is that. OK, no more questions, so thank you all. Sorry about the delay, and I'll see you next time in class. Bye.